Um, so with that, I will introduce our lovely April guest critic, Norma Cole. Um, so just a bit about Norma. Norma is a poet, but she's also a visual artist and translator, and I won't waste time by listing her dozens of books and accolades. Um, most recently, uh, Fate News, I think, which I've been reading now is amazing. Um, but I will say the work Norma has produced over her brilliant career is strange, restless, attentive. It's really everything I love about poetry. Um, her writing transcends conventional narrative and gets at modes of like perceiving that while not always linear, I think are accurate and intuitive in a different sort of way. Um, her ability specifically to play with temporality is endlessly interesting. And we're glad she brought this sensibility as well as an interrogation of um, movement and progression to the critics page this month. And for those of you that haven't read it, we will link to Norma's critic page, critics page for the rail um, here, but it's centered on the idea of the threshold. So the magnitude that must be exceeded for a certain reaction or condition to be manifested. And I think this idea of a tipping or breaking point is of course very relevant to our current situation as we're inundated by this temporal and determinist language of contagion, spread and flattening the curve. Um, and as we hear from Norma and the 10 poets who contributed to the April issue, I think we'll begin to see an alternative to this public language of progression through poems that modify and play with anticipation and expectation. So as readers and writers and appreciators of poetry, right now we're all sort of experiencing language from before a threshold. It's like, sometimes it feels like we're communicating before a door. So in the words of Norma in this liminal space, there emerge two questions. One, how great a surprise can you tolerate? And two, how small a surprise can you register? So I encourage you to keep those two questions in mind and I will hand it off now to Norma. Thank you, Madeline, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. I, I want to, first of all, say a big, big thank you to the rail, to Fong, and to, to his team. Thanks to Charlie, Nick, and our host, Madeline Craven. Thanks for keeping things going, especially now. We need it. The process of this April's critics page was like kind of making a quilt. Uh, it's a cooperative common project. It has squares. Each one is 800 or less words. And then what came into being was the range and variations of rhythms, patterns, colors, sensibilities. And now we get to hear this unfolding of the various voices. So all of the connections. And I'm, I'm going to begin with my uh, reading. It's uh, from the uh, prompt on the uh, page. It's part of the um, from the threshing floor, the beginning and the end, with a little post strip at the end. From the threshing floor, every, every, every work of art is political because every work of art is breaking new ground. That's Joyce Salcedo. Threshold is the operative word here. Threshold, the magnitude or intensity that must be exceeded for a certain reaction, phenomenon, result, or condition to occur, or it may manifested. Nothing happens until the signal passes the threshold. What signal? What threshold? For some reason, I had no words. I had some words, but they were, they would not settle into a rhythm. A bodily rhythm hadn't come yet. Instead, coming at me were flying objects, climate crisis, migrants, separations from of children from 
parents at borders, weapons, incarceration, solitary confinement, corporate takeovers, fascist, the technological singularity which kept Stephen Hawking nights, you name it, thresholds appeared. Meaning is in the rhythm or cadence. Writes Tisa Bryant in Letters to the Future. I will always reach back to see forward. Continuity is thrown into question. A threading and a fraying take place. Experience becomes an experiment from the Latin experimentum, which breaks down into exterior and mentum. Exterior is making a trial of, testing, putting to the test, and also experiencing, undergoing. It has curriculum in it, having to do with danger, risk. I seize upon the word danger, bringing to mind the quote from James Baldwin, to act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. We act. Today is December 10th, 2019, Human Rights Day, R-I-G-H-T, homophone for W-R-I-T-S-F-E-S. I can't write back from Hel Harriet Mellon's poem, All She Wrote. In September 2019, there was a series of climate strikes around the globe in which many of us took part. You broke our glacier was the message from children in one town at the foot of Mont Blanc. My first sense of Mont Blanc was the poem by Percy Shelley, Mont Blanc, lines written in the veil of Chamouni, which I first read in Grace grade school. On September 19th, I reread it. It begins the everlasting universe of things. Everlasting is and isn't about our mental representation of anything. Imagine the tallest mountain in Europe is set to release millions of gallons of ice. Nothing happens until the signal passes the threshold. I hold my breath and read on. And here's the postscript. Speaking of around the globe, two nights ago, I was working on my translation of John Dev's book, Paul Ceylon, they lay jour et les nuits. Paul Ceylon, day and night. And coming from Curation Press. In these days of pandemic, I try to focus. A section described Jared and Shalon in 1969, working on a translation of some poems from Johannes Poitvin's German to Dev's French. I was translating both the German and the French in order to come up with my version and I got to the line and swept the threshing floor clean with size. Thank you. And the next reader is Dale, Dale Smith. Dale Martin Smith lives in Toronto, Ontario, that's Canada, where I'm from, and teaches at Ryerson University. With Robert Bertoff, he edited an open map, the correspondence of Robert Duncan and Charles Olson, available in a new paperback edition from the University of New Mexico Press. 
still. Um, Dale, you should be unmuted now. Is that? How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Is that okay. Good? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I'm reading three sonnets today that appear in this month's critics page, and they're from a section of a manuscript titled Another Sky. I take the name from an 1851 letter Emily Dickinson wrote to her brother Austin, a portion of which reads, there is another sky ever serene and fair, and there is another sunshine, though it be darkness there. Um, I'm grateful to Madeline for hosting this event and to Norma for her words and from the threshing floor, especially these. Propose a path, a development which is progression but not progress. Suppose, in this case, development without positive or negative value, merely change, movement. For example, the movement of waves, motion, which is time and refers beyond itself. Meaning is in the rhythm of cadence. I look for a place in temporal things. I play dumb in some instances. Listen to how far I ran from playtime center. Endure in time's relevance with eyes seeing street lights flash on suddenly. I send material spirit ghosts across American distances, standing forlornly in blank or blunt manliness. A river unwinds in her mouth where voices belong to no one, not even a child. Dead leaves rot in muck under husky laughter. I turn a phrase or saying that won't give, stepping onto a path of pink sand, spiritual bone thrust in mineral orbit. Self-surveillance delivers the new me in corporeal entrapment. I present myself to the sky. What I had wanted was not to forget, like when I was a child and desired to remember what or where I had been before I was born, or tried to recall all that comes after me in a future I cannot witness, flooded footprints reduced to mud, not me, but what me contains, transmits sentences to particular instances of movement, windows open patio by evening traffic's flatness, spilled purchases, gas grill. There is a wound the size of paradise. Compose oneself to a muddy depth, like I was somebody out there looking for the aurora borealis. Secular spirits crack the sky open from any beginning, moving onward an open field. I marvel at the edge knowing and forgetting, I am mostly archaic and 3% Neanderthal. I aspire to crow views, plural, like leaves in gutter trash or plastic straws. Tear skin, white father. Open voices, my blackfoot daisy. I met a man in Memphis dancing in wilderness traffic. Con men waved from the deck of a steamboat. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, very, very lovely. Norma, uh, I am unmuting you now to introduce the next reader. Susan Briante, a poet, essayist, and translator, is the author of books of poetry, pioneers in the study of motion, utopia, and mindset, and the market wonders monument a series of essays on immigration archives, a synthetics in the state will be published by Nomeini Press in 2020. Susan. Hi, thank you. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah. great. Um, thank you, Madeline, for hosting us. Thank you, Norma, for bringing us together. It's really lovely to be in conversation with poets who are my friends and poets that I admire so much. I'm 
I'm actually going to read a poem that appeared in the March issue of the Brooklyn Rail. Um, so I also want to thank Ansel Berrigan for giving it space there. And this poem is from my forthcoming book, Defacing the Monument, which will be published in August by Noemi Press. The poem's called Further Exercises. Write a 12 line rhythmically charged poem in which you slant rhyme at least twice the name of the last official indicted from the Trump administration. Reference the most recent climate change related disaster. Address by first name one of the 24 migrants who have died in ICE custody since 2017. End with the instructions given to you by a parent or guardian on what you should do when waking from a nightmare. Write a poem as an acrostic of the name of a person you love who is most vulnerable to US government policies. Include a quote, unattributed, from a writer killed by an authoritarian regime. Or a line in which you complete the phrase, I have birthed blank and buried blank. End with a line that snaps like a turnstile at your back, that closes like an iron gate behind you. Typographically represent the 650 miles of border wall teetering on the 2000 mile US-Mexico boundary. Write a three word refrain that could be used as a chant to tear the shroud of normalcy. Answer the question, what brought your parents to the place they birthed you? End with a line so open, it would allow both a child and an endangered Mexican gray wolf to step through. Begin with the city from which you write. Use your five senses to describe the most recently gentrified neighborhood. Personify a for sale sign or an underfunded public school. Do not include an image of a transient. Write a 48 line poem in which each line ends with you claiming executive privilege or some variation of the phrase. Answer the question, what do you call someone who cannot speak and comes without a name? Reference the last time you were terrified by a cop. End with a metaphor that gasps for air or water or end with a couplet that screeches like a line drawn in the dirt. Write a poem that binds you and your reader as tightly as the zip ties encircling protesters' wrists. Use empathy, compassion, complicity. Include all the reasons why you have not placed your body in the streets or the courts to protect the person you love who is most vulnerable to the state. Address that person. End with a line that moans like gas entering your tank or end with a line that divides nothing. In couplets, Describe the opening shot of a movie you would make to depict the events of the last year. Slant rhyme, the name of at least one known Russian hacking virus. Describe a monument, then deface it. End by completing the phrase, I would blank 2000 miles to end blank. Write a poem that records all the new developments that have occurred in our country's continued assault on migrants and or other non-white bodies while you were writing any one of the above poems. Make a list of words that sound like shots being fired on a residential street or that sound like children being herded into cages. Create a poem around these words. It should not rhyme. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. That was absolutely, that was amazing. Um, Norma, I'm unmuting you again. Do you know if Will is here? here? Will is yeah. here. Uh, yeah, I'm, here. So I'm unmuting you. Oh, great. 
Will Alexander, poet, novelist, essayist, aphorist, playwright, visual artist, pianist, has written nearly, lit nearly 40 books in the above mentioned genres, worth coming of mouth along the way. He is currently poet in residence at Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center in Venice, California. I give you Will as Alexander. Uh, thank you, Norma. And thank you, Madeline, for this conclave of uh, interesting minds and beautiful poetry. I'm going to read part of the uh, essay that I wrote for the rail. It's called Mirage as Errata. And cognitive projection ignites doppelganger by uncertainty, by unwieldy equation. The indigenous plane remains in its respiratory state, a quickened vibratory phantom, corrupted at an esoteric tipping point by a corrupted mind fevered by compulsive linearity that lingers as verbatim. This compulsion creates a mesmerizing, mesmerizing static feeling in its wake, a pulse print. a pulse print that lingers in the masses via the arid. This collective pulse print sires esoteric thinking points that harden as linear measurement according to compulsive visual data. The latter usurpation remains inherent with what I can understand to be imperial calculation. I'll go, I'll kind of stop at that point because there is a, um, it's quite quite a long piece and it's gonna go over the five minute mark, but what I wanted to do is mention a couple of things as I was presenting because of the uh, condition that we're in at this point now. We're in a condition where we're going into the darkness and uh, we wanted to you know, know that the poetry works as illumination, not as a, uh, not as, as a uh, conditional, you know, <sighs> A tipping point into the darkness, but we want to go into some kind of illumination verbally, and that's what I was uh, attempting to do to 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 mind the darkness to get to the light because darkness is embodied in light and vice versa. And in the words to see, to have vision, to hear orally, that's what I'm attempting to do in this essay. And I don't know if I read enough of it, but it, it goes on for a time, but. We're in time constraint here, but I wanted to emphasize the point that we're at a turning point in the evolution of the human situation, not just because of some exterior circumstance, but because of the interior welling up of things. And we find the symbolical evidence of new things like the Greenland shark or the, the magnetic sea worm in the uh, Australian seas that's going 150 feet not because of material measurements of uh, the Greenland shark living over 500 years, but because of it's mysterious, it's going into the Imago Ignota, that which is seeking the strange for the sake of the strange. What we're witnessing now is the, the rising of the cosmos itself through the human situation. And it's no longer business as usual, not in an ideological sense, but in a fundamental sense. And that's what I wanted to get into with the mirage as errata a mirage of the modern world over the past 150 years, 200 and Anthropocene, you know, 250 years. It, it's becoming irrelevant. It's kind of like looking at the way that, say, commercials air on, on commercial television. They don't seem to be relevant during this period and probably won't be relevant for the foreseeable future, if ever. So we want to begin to start to condition ourselves via language into another realm of seeing, of imagining, of actually, of being at a, almost at a cellular level where we can begin to transmute via the verbal. I, don't, I hope I haven't overstayed my time, but I thank you for your, your time and your, your, your gracious uh, support here uh, from the Brooklyn Rail and Norma. And thank you for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kanti. That was that was really great. Um, Norma, I'm unmuting you now to introduce the next reader. Okay. Thank you so much, Will. 
Moriarty is going to read it next. Laura Moriarty's personal volcano appeared from netbook book, Net book in 2019. She lives in Richmond, California. Laura. <clears throat> okay, I guess everyone can hear me now, yes? yes. Good, yes. good. Um, thanks, uh, Norma, for um, curating this lovely section of things and to the Brooklyn Rail for putting it out. And thanks, Madeline, for hosting. Um, I'm going to be reading from some stuff that um, I've been writing um, into this situation that we're in that's called Non-Death Diary. Um, the concept of non-death comes from an intro to the Lotus uh, Sutra that I was reading recently. Uh, and, um, and then I'm going to end with the piece that's in this um, collection, which I wrote just like two seconds before we all just went down. Um, the pieces are short and they're all dated. Uh, 41820, grief, its stages, disbelief, rage, and denial of the implications as being nothing like non-deaths, non-life, named here to undermine what on second thought seems simply to be each day's desired continuity as we wake, sit, eat, write, work, sleep, zoom, and speak as if floating heads, hoping for connections, expecting something besides the science fiction climate change pandemic adventure to extend beyond the longed for continuity, still wanted but only just as it dawns on us that what will happen has already gone too far to walk back. And what was formerly required is not possible now that we, I, are not only stuck but struck, never having not flown directly into it, fighting and falling like some great imaginary winged thing going down. For 2020, I draw a card and call you with my mind as no longer a metaphor but a person. You use your crisis voice to address the situation in which non-life occluded by non-death threatens, when next I dream we sit, hands held in a steady mudra, but wake to grief, disinfectant the male, inhale, exhale. 42120, fascism like COVID, contagious, sometimes fatal condition related to climate change, abuse of humans and animals, not a new but renewed threat, includes evil leaders, massive death, crime, bad money, bad laws, unsustainable terror, non-life, non-death, non-time. And then resolved. There are laws, internally generated knowledge, syndromes and causes, curses, prophecy, destination, country self, city self, every day a new problem, ironic hyperbole, limited omniscience, launch, voyage, arrival, alter, avatar, downward spiral. There are delayed consequences, double voicing, terrible danger, asymmetric warfare, not quite spring dawn, becomes the present disequilibrium to which not great, fake, safe, inevitable, or eternal, but disenchanted, able to win. In advance, we don't give in, too to our hunger for thought, creature comforts and pretense of freedom whose symbolic victims as oneself withdrawn into daily life's fearful interdiction, please not me. Nonviolence wish exists because I don't understand violence as lucky or protected, but in my mind privatized as it is, this unsettled awareness settles in of subjections, evil, incessant, incantatory lies displayed here as real predicament. Three, solved not by anthem, but promise, proposition, chance, stance, corroborative support system, commitment, and resolve. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was fantastic. Um, Norma, I'm meeting you again. Okay. Well, um, okay. Very nice to most recent. What? On your microphone? I, I'm hearing a little bit of background noise from you. Is there maybe anything on your mic? 
No. Okay, never mind. Then we'll just we'll, we'll just proceed. Okay, sorry to cut you off. Okay, yes, keep going with an all on mute Kareem if you want to just briefly give his bio. Can you hear me now? Yes, that sounds clear for sure. Farid Matu's most recent book is The Real Horse, Redolin, a book art collaboration between Matuk and Colombian artist, artist and Nancy Friedman Sanchez is forthcoming from Singing Saw Press. Furries. Thank you, Norma, and thank you um, to everybody, the Brooklyn Rail team. I love seeing everybody's faces and spaces who have um, shared their video while we're together. I'm going to read the piece that's in the folio that Norma curated. It's called Video Tryouts for an American Grammar Book. The title references uh, Horton Spiller's essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, an American Grammar Book. A name, not to accuse, but to evacuate. And there, occupy an accusation, serially. Oak and cypress relocated to keep watch together over their shade. A spider's filaments, invisible and new, a corner of the window. There is no backward. A turn of wind through the window at the filaments. A turn, a plow, an eager representative of technology. They withstand her eyes, the trees, lined stalls of private homes, a romance of staying in place, a technology of pride. Light at my thumb, lemon yellow line, what searching I've sent. A speckled bird swoops between the legs of two people in a video to seize the dead prairie dog from the fist of its keeper. The bird flies in a video it mistakes for another time. The bird has already threshed audience from the real people who understand. The sun letting the fog pass by. The audience that marvels. The audience that feels left behind in its own outline. Each a vaccinated child. The idea of a word realized as audience to the wailing. Cleansing organs of the word, it's transferring organs, swelling the inherited organs of the word lined in water for baptismal oration. In this yellow light, I'm glad for the sentence dropping off from the surface. A video of soldiers wailing after scenes of them sleeping. My eyes closing in my belief and interiority I've come to drop off. In their sleeping, their mouths agog, a video of boys spitting into each other's mouths, the depth from which, a man in a video giving his gut and face to be punched, a video of fields smoking, or a video of the mown grasses, a video of a man sucking another's cock by an ATV, their long beards orphaned into objects. The oak and cypress tendrils, binding black physics of live water running in the city creek to the river. The mold on concrete berms and the messages spinning on their maps. Voyage to the surface of sleep the soldiers seem to go to, a waking video, a sleeping video, expected all the way into its genre. A painted video carries the squeak of boats lurching at their moorings. A video orphans the voice Etel gives to reading her poems. A critic returns it. A video of a man's rectum bleeding fast from the mason jar that just broke inside his full feeling. A video made sacred by the last seven videos. A video of the bleeding or a video of what happened after his hand reaches to stop the recording. A mistake that sees the flesh the body tries to run from. Men sleeping placid beneath the river, looking up with both eyes, dedicated to the patriarchy, is the cover for a video of men congratulating men for writing about the ugliness of men. Boots 
in near unison, an uncomplicated feeling in a video of me tucked into a low back stretch, looking up at the plastered ceiling, humming a singer's dead white voice. That's on me, that's on me, I know. Watched by actual people in a glade getting closer to the sun. A video looking down to an evaporative line of water for the sun. Refrigeration, ornithology, benediction. Ernest mimicking a finite set of faces. A video of a US fighter pilot and I talking at the Delta Gate, his enthusiasm shining as far as the air will take it. A video of me hearing him say God's work for where his enthusiasm meets his enthusiasm for the mission. So his smiling can go inside himself. In a video of him showing me his flight helmet and oxygen mask, is a video of me seeing him holding his own head in his lap before it goes back in the customized bag. He has only altitude and the promise of an executioner renouncing hierarchies. A video they think they make, but I think it. My thinking worn away with its single eye knocked loose so it rolls inward is a name. A video of me among the conditions soft mole, hail tunnels, standing house. I narrow into a fine, stretchable line, thin blue, a bright yellow edge of least depth, the sound of its going down the hall. A door creaking in a video about the importance of sequencing begins down the hall. So the door will have somewhere to sound, hesitant or grand, opening onto the bank of the river, marking the edge to the motherland of objects, reposed, frayed, remembered in museums. You first, the water's fine. There is a feeling that I like where you love me and don't believe in me, even as a sentence expects to run from an event, a technology of staying, not of staying in place. Thanks. Oh, Farid, thank you so much. That was absolutely, uh, that was wonderful. Norma, I, I am unmuting you again now, or you're already unmuted. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Farid. Susan Gewertz's recent books of poetry include Hotel ABC and Aerodrome Orion and Starry Messenger. Her critical books are narrative driven with fiction and film writing of Dorothy Richardson and coming events. She is based in San Francisco. Susan. Susan, are you there? You're, you should be unmuted. I'm here. I'm muted? No. Am I muted? No, you're on. You're on. We can hear you. Okay, good. Good. Oh, thank you, Brooklyn Rail. Um, thank you, Madeline. And thank you, Norma, for bringing us all together. I'm going to be reading from what is in the April Brooklyn Rail. Um, I'm going to read the first, it has three sections. I'll be reading the first two and just a few paragraphs into the third. Three threshing floors or three invisibilities. First, after we hugged in greeting on Christmas in the visiting room at San Quentin Prison, the first thing Talib said, breaking into a wide smile was, ah, the sound of a baby crying, so wonderful. Among the many kinds of deprivation we live with here, in here, missing the sounds of the world is a huge one. Then we went straight to the vending machines. With our bounty, we sat facing each other on the same side of a table. He told me about his parole appeal. We talked about his memoir and the other writing he does for trade. 
If someone inside needs their story written, he writes it for stamps or other necessities. Living and writing living, I am Talib's writing mentor and friend. He had bought photo tokens, so we, a Muslim and a Jew, had our picture taken in front of the dusty plastic Christmas tree. Then it was 1.50 and everyone had to be out by two. We hugged goodbye, thanked each other for the visit, and I joined the crowd of mostly families moving toward the screening exit. A lot of people were crying. I wasn't, but I felt emptied, tense, exhausted from being tracked and under scrutiny every second on the way in, while in, and on the way out. And I was only there for a few hours. On the phone a few weeks later, Talib said, we've been under the fog line. It means we can't go out on the yard because they might not be able to see us. Can't go to the post office either. You could escape or cross a border in fog, or you could be disappeared in it. Second, in a coal cart on a track I rode past sleeping lions underground in an abandoned mine. The wooden cart was no longer used for coal. There was no danger of collapse. The lions were close but docile as they turned in dreams of spinning, extraction along the seam, chaff, dross, tailings, into what is happening, what happening is. Of the many guises of that problem, the news, narcissistic parent, delivers inertia, distance, hunger for information, or being held in the mind of the mother in utero is the original holding environment. Children not held in the mind of their mother are lost, forgotten. If the sight of you is obliterated, you cannot imagine being seen or heard, World, wordless or bludgeoned by words, worldless or on my mind. Thus the requirement, follow the thread as if there is an outside to the locked room of etymological despair. The brilliant guy diagnosing why my furnace quit in January said, I get better and better at fixing things and I have less and less idea why or how. Rhythmicity, as Maria and Nicholas Torup call it. Call and response or the answer song as Tyrone Williams calls it. Buzz pollinators striking middle C or sonication, so I've heard. Third, with their white heads and tails, you can spot them from far away. Aren't they easy prey? Bald eagles are soaring up and down the valley over the river. No, because full grown adults have no known predators. They are bright so they can see each other, I add, making it up. To be born to the world is for each to enter abrupt and knowledgeable into the simple or thrashed truth of one's materiality, knowing that that which is not destined to a relation to the other is worthless. Glissant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was fantastic. Uh, Norma, I am unmuting you again now. All right. Thanks, Susan. Even beside him, the most recent verses are Plain Sight and Situ. His collection of photographs uh, include Pipe Bell, Ber Berlin, and Im Imaging Failure, Abandoned Lives of the Italian si South. He lives in San Francisco some of the time. <laughs> Thank you, Norma. Thank you, Madeline and the uh, Brooklyn Rail. It's great to be with you all today. Um, I'm going to read from 
the piece in the Brooklyn Rail this month. It's called uh, The Prayers of the Saints. What is at stake, what has been wagered, is neither our hope for recovery nor our faith in retribution, but our dream of escape. We are grounded, we are tethered to an absence without term. We think we must progress to be contented, to be suckered, but it's decadence that leads us into boredom as a cure. They slept naked in their cassocks. There are reasons to admire their decision to withdraw. They hesitate before us. It was never their desire to advance a scheme, to claw their way back from the brink, but this is now their world. What difference if the mountain leaps, if every prick and twinge forecasts the ecstasy of pincers gouging almond eyes? No matter where you place your glance, they will appear. Crawl into any orifice and plot a path to nescience. Feel the tongue turn once and twice, then vanish like a worm. The intensity of inattention. Withdrawn from alterity, we cleave only to affect, to the differentiation of redacted size. Let the suitors take their pot shots. The cannons hurl. Let them fall in drunken conquest to the blacktop, the bloody sword. Only cower in the corner. It's not your fight to lose. When no one else is left, the exile takes up the prerogative, the final substitution and the endless interlude. Our next last opportunity, or perhaps it's just the first, something always happens, something I'm forgetting, something that is neither seen nor ceded to the knout. But there was once a chance that there always was a chance. I can't tell you what will happen, but I can at least say this, no matter how one signals one's imperils and abductions, how fervently one, one grapples in the capture of the next redoubt, there will always be a way to sally forth into abandon, a passage to the next retreat, the slink across. The imperative is to recognize there's going to be nothing, that every new emergence from the merit of the void condemns its source to insufficiency, begins, that is, the retrogress to that dissembled exigence, the faltering return to all that's forfeit of the forfeit, all that's missing of the lost. It's not what makes us happy, but what fashions us persistent, what substitutes the infinite recurrence of the same for a determined thrust. A diet of corrosion, scourged and shriven from its terminus, so many loose ends, so much grown familiar, so many souls, so many vassals bound and plunged beneath the current, the guilty free their hands and swim, the innocent fend with their mouths and drown. Those who are proscribed within the stasis of catastrophe, who are properly made subject to the onslaught it surveils, can no longer be interrupted. Their interruption is unending, is determined as a predicate, as a fracture set within each rift, a thresh of only tears. One who does not meet the gaze of those who would give refuge, who refuses to be solaced in the pity of an eager stare, is thereby made invisible to all who would glean meaning from the tillage of this ravaged veil. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Steve. That was that was fantastic. Uh, back, back over to you. Thank you. That was a amazing. Uh, Aaron Murray. Aaron is the most is the elements and most recent translation is Uxio Novo Nevas, the Upwinds Book of the Corel and other poems from the Calician. She holds a paper in Montreal. Thanks, uh, Norma. Hello, everybody. Thanks, uh, Norma and Madeline and the Brooklyn Rail for bringing us all together. This has been a marvelous uh, time hearing everybody read. Um, I was going to read a, a page, start by reading a page from The Elements, which is a book of mine that came out last year. And this page, in fact, I'm going to read both sides of it. It's, uh, it's grayed out as if, as if you could tear it out of the book and throw it out or throw out the book and keep the page. It's about uh, practice in more than one language, I guess, articulating the shaking. If multilingual is to speak plus one languages serially, polylingual is to speak plus one languages concomitantly. It acts to induce or permit thought or affect not possible in a single and flattened linguistic realm. Did we try to dissipate what we knew or were to know? A were to knowing seems a plurality where verbs move not bidirectionally, translation, but across multiple differential planes, osidadan, thought out polylingually. Yet we inhabit the monolingual paradigm of translation in which via German poet Liliana Wolf bringing Turkish-German Yasmin Yildiz's thinking into Musqueam, Salish, Vancouver. Monolingual means we verse one language into another where it confronts the unilingual in which only one language exists as infinity pool or anthem with no horizon. Articulating the tunnel as shaking or cave Against both mono and uni lies the polylingual, which is to translate an alternate memory embedded in the poems, to quote Wolf, an embedding which thus awaits the cellular metabolism of the translator, whose mitochondria are articulating the cave or shaking. Paddles raised in unison, standing in the boats. The other side of that, it says plasticities, plasticities whole. What we were to know is thus uninterpretable, for interpreters interpret from a single idiom into another singularity, obscuring the very deformation in thinking's membrane that are polylingual, polylingually plastic across linguistic competencies and which make thinking thinking. To arrive at this metabolic urgency, Namlos, yes, Deridian used dis dreamers, the nameless, those baracos or holes in the skull that metabolize in my dad as a silent deterritorialization so that all presence welled up, dear poppy, is a trickle of fear. So that's just the, the two pages from the elements. And I was going to read as well the, the piece uh, that was in the Brooklyn Rail. There's several ways to read the piece or fold it or unfold it. Um, and I'm torn which way to uh, do that. But the, the piece itself comes from a desire not to articulate necessarily, but to participate to in something else. And where I'm participating is actually, um, uh, and there's a, a link in the Brooklyn Rail to the image of a, a notebook of a, of a kid who spent two years uh, living underground with his family during the Second World War near my mom's village in Ukraine. So the poem is called The Chessboard Drawn by the Child Kuba, and it's more or less arranged by me, although there's some thinking in gray as well. If saying this makes it marred or it is subject to copyright or ejected, 
warped faction, my words, or there is no new arrangement, no destiny. Do not alter, do not remove. Under a pigsty in darkness, a chess board in a notebook, one leaf of paper under a pigsty, darkness, breadcrumbs for pieces. The child Kuba of Bobrka plays chess with Lipa, his twin. Sad I am for you, stupid country, if saying it makes for less lonely or souvenir de sou. A membrane is earth's skin above or under the pigsty, light once a week, after Shabbat, one lit candle. Draw the furniture in our house, said his mother, Sarah, and into the notebook goes the furniture. Draw the horse in the road, said Sarah, his mother, and into the notebook goes the horse and road. Its harness gleams, its hide brushed in pencil. Repeated small agonies gray with reason. Do I speak? Or do I simply shelter, take shelter, or endeavor? Below the pigs, the chessboard drawn and crosshatched, every second square a threshed field, the child Cuba, later Jack. Old, his chessboard in darkness, no room to stand up beneath the pigs, Lipa, Celia, Sarah, Leon, Cuba. Sad I am for you, stupid category, if saying it makes it for less lonely or for memories shouts, earth's loam. Is that a treasure? Oh yes, it is. Under the pigs of farmer Tekach Ernstorf in darkness, edge Bobrka, 1942, two years later, April 1944, the arrival of the Red Army, one week to open eyes to daylight, two weeks to walk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. That was fantastic. Um, Norma, back over to you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Erin. And then there's another Erin, Erin Sheeran, who is Professor of Management of the University of San Francisco's MFA writing pro program and the author of 14 books of poetry and prose. And he uh, has his new book, The Blue Absol Absolute from the Night World. Um, Aaron Shuren. Thank you. Thank you, Norma, Madeline, and Brooklyn Railers for putting this on. I'm gonna read from a, a long poem called Shiver. And this is uh, a section called Shake. It's the last, the last section of five. Uh, there's two um, persons of the poem. Uh, there's the narrator who, who is in both in the first and third person, who may or may not be me. And there is another figure who is a, a scribe or maybe the author of events, a figure who may be me also. This is part five of Shiver called Shake. A shiver is a rip in time. He puts his ear to the ground where the deep magma sings. History is a version of the future, a sweep of pterodactyl wings in rising light. The pavement quivers like jelly, but doesn't split as the hot steam vents. The future is underground the city beneath the city. It has to be endured while the crippled buildings sway, molded when still hot, sculpted in the thrill of the wind. She watches from a distance, waiting for the ink to dry, hand raised high in the air as if trying to escape the pull of the page. She wants a new sheet clear as an alien sky, blue, white, and tight right to the edges. And boom, it was like someone had dropped a piano on the floor above me, more a thud than a shake, except I lived on the top floor, no one above. Then a groan as though someone, something trapped below wanted to get out, get in. 
The house shivered and shook. If I say open, is hot lava my evil twin? With his night vision goggles, green eyes, he looks for every crack in time, every seam about to slip, every hollow and hole, to let the old city roar in and wake the sleeping, walking, unlooking, pixel-bound dead. Where is the sky now? Does it pulse like an organism? Does it breathe in silver waves and tremble like morning dew? The sky beneath the sky. And you, with your long hair like strands of fire, I think we burned up that bed. I think we live in those flames, still burn. I think our kisses are comets in the shimmering sky. And in the hot silence of the blank streets, he walks as if in a trance with time stretched and stacked like plates, and my mother's eyes squinting to keep the plates conflated, invisible gravity, while the temblers rock his footsteps, and the wooden houses squeal in their beautiful joints, and the violins of the tall cedars wail their ache and awe. Up the steep hill behind his house, where the downtown towers seem already pitched forward, ready to fall, and the far out Pacific racing in, green eyes of the deep water where the bones of the buildings lay, the city quivers. Now, but before the great shiver, he buries his face in his cupped hands as if submerged in deep, deep water, holding his breath to stop time and lock in the memories. Her arm, her raised arm aching, but desperate to live the pause to hold back the footnotes on tent cities, tossed syringes, immune deficiencies, and release the city from its litany of litanies. He spins in place to keep his balance and ride out the shake. History is a whirlpool from which only the spinners wake, in common purpose out of a hole in the sea. I remember hot lava made me what did they see? What did they know? How did they work? How did they work together? Who did they want to be? Who did they become? How many had green eyes? How many loved history? Whose mother's heart blew apart at sutures in a last attempt to keep the ways in play? Once I fell to the floor in my little house in a skylight beam of almost solid sun and lay my cheek on the bamboo planks in a pose of surrender and a shiver of thanks. Once we climbed the distant mountain in the eastern county after big rain, with the thick mud congealing around our shoes like bear traps, locking our steps. Still we trudged on, mud bound, not for the summit per se, but just to see from the top the city across the bay, shining in its sheath of western light with the glamorous fog like a sequin cape on its shoulders, jeweling the shadows, sunset couturier, and the red tinted hawks wheeling in a vortex of suspended breathing. The city shimmers. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you so much. Norma, back to you to introduce our last reader. <clears throat> okay, the last reader. Is Paul Swenson. Cole is a poet and a translator, and her most recent book is On Walking On. Cole. Thank you, Norma, for getting us all together and for doing this. And thanks, Madeline, for organizing this part of it too, and to the whole Brooklyn Rail. Um, I'm going to read the piece that was in the rail, which includes in the middle a brief musical interlude. Thresh, the question, what drifts, drifts off? Well, history is fixed. In fact, is entirely based on that which stays. Away, go away, said the wheat. Away, said the day. The day said, there's a way that music comes back to you. The beat comes back in its fray. There's a way that music folds itself into intricate structures, now lost in a pocket. 
You're sure you put it somewhere or put it away. Go, said the lost. Lost, said the day. Threshing is about what weighs and the ways in which that does or does not weigh us down. What key is it in, Robbie? So I'm back to thinking about what gets beaten out of it, about what flies off from it, about what the it is that gets so beaten in all of us humming under our breath. There's chaff in the air and it will stay there. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. That was a very lovely poem and a very lovely musical interlude. Thank you, Cole. Um, so I don't quite think we have time, unfortunately, to do a Q&A, um, but just before we close, uh, and we'll end with a poem uh, that Norma will read. And I just wanna thank all of you for, for reading, all of our poets who read and everyone who came to listen. There are a lot of new faces here today, and that's really incredible. Um, so we do this every day at 1 p.m. ET, and we have a conversation tomorrow that will be really exciting between Noam Chomsky and Paul Maddox. So we really encourage everyone to just keep coming. We love, we love to see everybody here every day. Um, and thank you, poets, especially. It's, this is a very interesting time to be thinking about language and thresholds and how we sort of push, push into experiences. Um, but I'll leave it at that and we'll close with Norma uh, reading a poem. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to read from a piece by Bart Leroy Bibb in this book that is called Double Trouble with Ted Jones and Hart Leroy Bibb's Shadows or Reflections. The pas de deux of the tap dancers or whatever else they may be or maybe not be doing are making sounds visible by per performing and deforming. They identify a minute fraction of chaos itself. As a famous friend of mine, Sugar Blue, a famous blue man told me one day, anybody can tap dance who can play the trap drums. It's all rhythms making invisible visible then by ordering it out of chaos. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Norma. Um, I'm gonna unmute everybody now if people wanna just say goodbye on their way out, or I'm trying to unmute everybody. Thank you, Norma. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.
Thank you, Todd, for Thank dancing. You, that was so cool. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Will. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Have Thank a great you. day, everybody. Happy day. Much Hi, love. Carolina. I see you back there. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Thanks for coming. Bye. 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 Bye.